can do. And actually, let's go ahead and just go into the keyboard shortcuts to show a couple of those real quick. So before I get into the keyboard shortcuts, my computer doesn't want to completely hard lock here. Hello. All right, great demo. All right, let's uh, bounce this guy real quick. My uh, other presentation when I was in the little room, I like hooked it up to the HDMI here, and my computer just completely hard locked. Like I couldn't even control the lead. I had to like hard power the thing. Fun of live. Let's try that one more time. Do. I mean, at least it's not a Mac. At least I don't got Ben's problems, so you know. All right, I think we are alive again. All right. So um, the first thing I just want to show is, you know, what is an AST? So at the top there, I have a script block. Script block that does git help, whatever. You know, and it doesn't have to be git help. It can just be something, whatever. But any script block that you define, when you take that and you run it down in the terminal, let's do a fresh terminal here. Um, you know, you get, you know, you can just dollar script block. I don't even do this, but whenever you have something in those braces, anything you define as a script block, that's actually an object, just like anything else. So if I do script block, type into get member, as you can see, it's a special object called a system management automation script block. It's got all kinds of properties on it, all kinds of stuff you can do. But it's, you know, even in PowerShell, just that basic thing that you do is not just text, it's an object. And one nifty thing that you can do with that script block is in these properties, if you look about halfway down here, there's this property called AST. And this is a getter that will automatically parse and prepare that script block and get the AST version of that script block I wrote. Now again, it doesn't have to be valid code, but it has to be parsable code. Like I said, it, at this point, it's not caring that git ff doesn't exist. It's simply just parsing the code using the PowerShell parser and turning it into an object representation of your PowerShell code. So in this, basically you see it, it comes down there to end block, and then I have extents, and then I have parents. So I'm not going to go too much into all the different little properties here, but the idea here is just to show you is that there's a lot of detail in terms of it breaks it down by parameter, what those parameters are, what their object type could be. And not only that, each of these individual things have all kinds of methods that you can do to find information out of them. A lot of them are useful for a lot of very specific cases, but the one that you will be using probably 90% of the time are the find and find all methods. These are basically things where you've got the code and it's just a really fast way to look at this whole object hierarchy and see if it meets a certain pattern. So if you're, for instance, defining a script analyzer block, let me uh, make sure that doesn't go to sleep on me again. Uh, if you're defining like a script analyzer block, then um, you know for the whole thing, maybe you're just looking for anywhere somebody wrote right host, because as you all know, right host kills kittens, even though it doesn't anymore, but let's keep that meme going. So um, rather than have to like do a regex search, which can be slow, um, you can use these functions find and find all to get that really quickly. And But it has all kinds of ways you can uh, apply additional criteria, almost sort of like a SQL query language, just in the sense of you can say, get right host, but only get the ones that are followed by a, a text-based script block and only the ones that, you know, don't have um, foreground or, you know, these certain parameters in them. Uh, that tool becomes really useful for writing these things, um, and we'll show some examples of what that looks like. So for our first example, when we were talking the keyboard shortcuts, here is a PS readline profile. And so this is the file that you find in that GitHub. And this is just an example one. It shows you some options, some examples of setting options, some examples of rebinding keys, if you want to rebind how those work. But then right away, you get down here into the set PS readline key handler. So these are things that are ways to create new different shortcuts um, based on whatever you want. So the way you define one of these is you have a set PS readline, you have key F7. And again, I'm taking the file directly, like, you know, there's backticks in here. I hate backticks. I would splat the heck out of this, but I'm just showing you the reference example. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, so here's an example of a key S3 line handler with F7. You can make it so F7 show, would actually show your, your command history. And then here's a script block for how it processes it. Now, this is going to get a little dot netty, but, you know, hang in here with me on this. So first of all, you're starting with a pattern. Basically, what's our starting point? We're just initializing that variable. 
And the reason we're initializing that variable is because a lot of these functions were originally written for like C-sharp. They're not really written for PowerShell, but they do work in PowerShell. But they use some c sharp -y concepts that while they do work in PowerShell, you don't see them a lot. So this is going to be a little unintuitive to you, when you if this is the, your first time seeing it. The main one of those is what's known as a reference variable. So if you see that ref there next to get buffer state, um, see how it has this ref dollar pattern? So get buffer state is a command that's simply like, hey, I want to know my PS read line buffer. Like basically, it's what have you typed into the PS read line console so far? Like I typed something in the console where like, you know, maybe I wanted to do import module and I want to see the history. This, this, this one was written before predictive IntelliSense. Obviously, all that stuff happens for you automatically now with that. But this was something where you could add this and hit F7 and get the history. And the way that it would work is that you would have import ma, for instance, and if you would hit F7, this would go and get buffer state, get that you've written import ma so far. And that ref pattern, that reference variable just simply says, I defined pattern up here. And I'm telling the program that when you run, populate the variable using this reference. So populate this variable. It's a little backwards from what you're used to. You're used to saying like, hey, I'm defining a variable. And then, you know, this variable equals get, you know, get buffer state. This is sort of a little bit like backwards where you're running the method and you're giving the method this reference and telling the method, hey, populate that variable. So this is kind of almost like doing like dollar pattern comma dollar, you know, equals this. And there, it's done this way for a really good like .NET-y reason, but you don't really need to worry about that. All you just really need to know is that if, when you see this ref and it seems super weird, it's just simply saying it's passing the pointer to this variable I've already defined so that that method can do something with it and populate it. So, and then it's, uh, if that pattern exists, um, which is you know how we're going to match, then it does that regex escape, uh, searches the history, and goes through each of the lines of the history and then comes back out. So there's nothing terribly like AST related with this individual one, but what you can do is um, bring up some information like here with a script block and do some various git selection states and get more detail where you can actually get the full buffer state and get the AST version of it. So if you're doing something like this particular uh, handler, which is smart inserting quotes, if you put in this one and you, you hit the... Uh, if you do a quote or a double quote, if this is basically a PS read line key handler that you can add, where if you're writing something and you've put like doll, you know, you've put like an interpolation where you want to take a variable and have it become something in the string, it'll automatically switch you from single quotes to double quotes depending on whether you have string interpolation or not, without you having to do it and having to go back and delete it out. Uh, this thing, as you type, when you hit that, when you hit either the the comma or the quote key. It runs this script block, goes through and does all this work. But here's where it's actually using the AST because what this wants to do is it wants to look at what you've typed and then use the PowerShell parser to parse it and get out that AST object. And then what it wants to do is go through all the tokens here. And this, this kind of does it kind of a funky way. This doesn't really use that find tool that I had. This is sort of like the powershell -y way of doing it. This is a lot slower than using that find method. But again, I'm just showing these examples. A lot of these examples are really old. Um, that they come out of there. But the key thing to take it from this is that you see where we get all those tokens from the AST and we can go through them and we see, hey, if, if, if we can take one of these tokens and it turns out that it, it can be cast as a string expandable token, which basically just means that it's the PowerShell equivalent of knowing that you define something that has like, you know, my name is dollar name versus like my name is Joe. So if it was like my name is dollar name, the PowerShell parser knows just by that syntax, it can know that you wrote something that you want to be able to change out dollar name for Joe. And they, call, they just call that a string expandable token. So by doing this comparison, we can see if that's the case. If that exists, then what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and do that result where it goes through and resets the cursor position, goes over and rewrites it and changes those single quotes to double quotes. So if you want to have a shortcut that does that, as we have these, if I copy all these and I'll bring up my very fancy extension terminal, which if you were in a Andy's session in here just before, you now perfectly understand how all of this works, so I don't have to explain anything. And we will just take this read line profile, copy path. Oops, I've got this big fancy folder thanks to the psconf EU requirements, so I've got to quote it. Okay, so I, just, I was just loading in that uh, configuration there. 
And so what we can do is we should be able to do, I do a, this is dot name. Okay, there, oh, oh, kind of fixed it. <laughs> But you saw there, like when I when I when I did that typing and it, it had there for the dollar name, how it like moved the uh, uh, quotes around. That was one of the examples. And then we have, for instance, get if I do F7 here. Why is it not being happy with me? Oh, it did not like that. Oh, there it goes. So when I hit F7, um, I did the get, and now it pulled up a um, out grid view of all the commands I had that I've done so far that have the word get in it. So it's rather than just like how you have like your inline. You can get this, and because it's out grid view, you can filter and do all that kind of stuff. And if I want to select like this one that I was doing and hit enter, then it'll take that and then put it down into, and I mashed the F7 key there. So this, this is basically like an alternative of doing like, like the F2, like the predictive IntelliSense. This is like the old school way that you could do it where you would get a, um, an out grid view, pick the thing that you want to do that has that word get in it, and then hit OK and then it would populate into your PS read line. So all of that is written in PowerShell. It's one of those PS read line key handlers. That's one idea of something that you can do. So I had an idea of something that I really like. If I have like a command that I want to know how it works, I wrote one that's something like, if I want to get verb, and we'll see if this works in VS Code. I'm gonna have to jump out. Okay, so I just hit F1 on my keyboard. Actually, I should probably uh, turn on screen cast mode so you can see this. Pretend that that's not there yet. So git verb, and I'm wondering, like, how does git verb work? Well, you could do git help, and you kind of get it in the console, but it's kind of tough to scroll, and it can be small, and that kind of thing. So I made a PS read line key handler where I just hit F1, and what it does is I now get a nice GUI version of my help that can be searched and, you know, detailed. I got a nice view of all that help in a nice, uh, tight version. And this works not just in VS Code. This works anywhere PowerShell runs. So if I do it in just a Windows terminal, it should be part of my profile, so it should work. So I do git verb, and I hit F1 here. Um, so the terminal version, I also have a version where if it can detect that you have a web browser installed and that that help is available, it will go out and go to the Microsoft Docs page. So when I hit F1 there, it my little script found it, detected it, and did that, went out and found the Microsoft Docs page for it. So I don't have to search for it. Uh, you know, I didn't even have to use Copilot. I can just hit F1, and it'll take me right to the Microsoft Docs page for that. So let me show you how that guy works real quick. So again, this is in my profile, which may not be here. I don't think I brought it in. Um, let's see, to do, maybe it didn't. All right, so we'll go out to my profile outside. Brody dot files, there it is. files. These folder names are going to look weird. This is all a chamois thing. Don't worry about it. Okay, so here is the, the, what I defined for that. And so you see sort of the same things that I discussed before, where you have, I wanted to get an AST and get the tokens and that kind of thing. And so then I do the same buffer state thing and I got these, I'm sorry, that's super tiny. I apologize. Actually, let's do this. Can I do my dot? Is it going to work? Come on. So if you didn't know this, um, in, if you're anywhere in GitHub, you can just hit the period key and it'll open up a web-based version of Visual Studio Code and open up your code there. You don't even have to have Visual Studio Code installed. This was, this was advertised a ton when they implemented this, but if you weren't aware of that, you can just hit period anywhere and it takes you to the GitHub dev version. So this is, as you see, this is running in my web browser. This isn't um, on my local VS Code, but you can make local VS Code work too. So if we get back down here to the help, um, and of course, as I like to say, I always like to credit my sources. So I came up with this because I looked at that sample that I just showed you. And one of those examples, I was like, oh, like that history one. I was like, oh, I wonder if I could hook in something to do like help with. And so I was just inspired by that and decided to write my own. So I have this git buffer state. Now it's where that other example used the tokens thing. This one actually does the sort of quote unquote proper fast way, which is using this find all command on the AST. And this was written before this was a thing, but now thanks to all the great improvements that have been happening in VS Code, uh, this won't work in the browser, but if I put AST ahead of that variable, 
if you come down here and you do dot f you'll get IntelliSense for all this stuff. You'll get dot find all. So it's really good if you can to type your variables in PowerShell now because you'll get all kinds of cool IntelliSense if you do. Um, that if you watch my optimizing presentation from uh, PS Summit and I'll show more about that there. So um, this find all, as you can see, takes a couple interesting parameters. Basically what you do is you provide it what's called a predicate. So this is again, this is another dot netty term, but it's, excuse me, a del you provide it a, a Predicate or delegate? Predicate, I believe, yeah. You're basically providing it a script block that's either going to return true or false. And so that and that just simply tells it it's going to go through and look at every single like token and evaluate this script. It's kind of like when you do like where object. When you've got a list of things and you say where object, do this. And so if it comes back true, include it in my list. If it doesn't come back true, discard it. So you're basically doing that here. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking for this, uh, this first thing is basically the way that the delegate works. This part's sort of like not super discoverable if you don't know how to read it. So, but just assume for now, the arg zero will basically be your first, you know, it's the, it's the AST of whatever um, is currently in the buffer. See that git buffer state, basically if I've done, when, when I had there and I typed uh, git verb, so it, came, it would bring back the AST representation of git verb. So if I did like a script block and I put in git verb like you saw there before and I did the dot AST, same thing. So, uh, so this is assigning it to that special AST object. So the first thing I want to do is I want to know if that AST is just a command. So if all you did was type git verb and then I'm comparing it saying here saying it, did it get cast to that command AST type? Because again, it's the PowerShell parser. It has parsed what's gone on, and then it breaks it out into all these different types, very specific types of what each word or dash or parameter or anything that means. It's very, very specific so that then, because computers like things to be very specific, and then it can go and process your PowerShell code. This, this thing happens every time you run any kind of PowerShell code. It's happening, you know, a million times every time you do a session. So it's kind of neat as... Just like with the VS Code, you get to see what's behind the scenes. This is basically what's happening behind the scenes with any PowerShell code you run anywhere. Um, so when you do that, so I want to make sure that it has a command. And I also want to make sure that where the cursor is in the extent is the cursor somewhere on the word. And the reason I did that was that if you have a big long command that you've already like cut and pasted in, but you don't know what one of those commands do, you can back up the cursor and hover it over the one command that you don't know, hit F1, and it'll only bring up help for that one command. So that's what, that's what that part of the code does. So then we get down here and we say, okay, well, if it's not null, because if it's null, then there's nothing to do. And so if, when you hit F1, it just doesn't do anything. So this is what's called, uh, um, basically, we, we filter to make sure that um, I did actually match what I wanted to match. So at this point, if I have matched what I wanted to match, because it's a command AST, some of those little AST pieces that I showed you in that tree, they have their own special functions. Like I showed you when I did the git member and there was like all that stuff, certain individual functions have their own special aspects of them. And you can find this out by reading the documentation, using git member. You know, when you, when you have this profile, you can debug these. So you can hit a breakpoint in VS Code and then hit F1 and then it'll stop at that point. And you can actually look at like what came back to make sure it's okay. Um, so this particular one has a special method called git command name. And so this is just a simple way to take that git verb, actually get me the string representation of that object. Um, which seems really simple. I mean, like, it's git verb, it's an object of git verb, why is this so complicated? This command actually does a little bit of extra sanitization. Like, if the character had, like, special characters or something that might blow up a string, it handles for those. So it's just a little bit of extra work to make sure that we don't get into an exception area. So again, another null check. Null checks are always good. This saves you from really weird null pointer exceptions where you can't figure out where the problem is. So basically, if, if that result's not null, then great. So now in my execution context, I can actually find out if it's a PowerShell command. Um, let's say the thing was like invoke, um, you know, like invoke az rest method as an example. Those all come from modules. And so I'm going to go here and I'm going to look inside of PowerShell and say, hey, what basically this says, what module did that come from? This is like a .NET equivalent of basically saying um, like doing like, uh, like git command, the command name, and then looking at like what the module product. Uh, aspect is. This is just another way of doing it. It's just faster than going that way because we want our keystrokes. We want when we do those keystrokes, we want to be fast as possible. So you'll see me do a lot of like non PowerShelly things just to make it faster, which is a good reason to. Um, so at that point, 
Okay, I got the command. And then this is another important thing. If that command is an alias, I don't want to get try to get the help for the alias because it's not going to exist. I need to find out what the original command was. So this makes it so that, like for instance, if you had if you were piping to sort and you did the F1 on the sort, uh, if I didn't have this code in here, it wouldn't do anything. But this code knows that, okay, sort's an alias of sort object. And that, so I need to go look for the help in sort object. And that's what that does. And so, and here's this part that I have here. First, let's go ahead and try online. So now that I know the command, I verified that it's, an, it's not an alias, that it's an actual command, then I can go to the thing, and now I just run a simple PowerShell command where it's the equivalent of typing git help, you know, invoke az rest method, dash online, and then all, all very important, the dash error action stop. Which basically, if it doesn't find the help, it'll throw an error. Otherwise, you get that nice little web browser that you saw that showed the command help. So I might be on a platform that doesn't support web browsers. I might be SSH'd into something. I might be any of those kind of things. So I still want to be able to get my help, even if I can't open a web browser on that. So if this action fails, the script doesn't die. You see there I do a catch of an invalid operation exception, which is what it'll throw. It'll throw something like, you know, I can't, there's no browser here. There's no start command to start a browser. So rather than just have the script blow up, okay, well, if that happens, then what I want you to do is... Um, First of all, make sure that it's this, the help topic doesn't exist at all. Because if it does, that's a situation I don't know how to handle and throw that out. I want to get an error if that's the case. And I want whoever is using my keyboard extension to file an issue with me because that's something that I wasn't expecting. But again, this is what's kind of known as what's called a guard clause. By defining it this way versus saying if else, my, my code's already getting like super nested. This is a way to keep it from getting even more nested. So... Um, and again, I wrote this a long time. I probably wrote this like four or five years ago. If I were to write this today, this code would be much flatter. I'd be using many more of those kind of guard clause style versus the if else stuff. Um, so then finally, if that doesn't work, then I do git help that same command dash show window. So that only works on Windows windows because it requires the, um, the GUI part, the XPF stuff. Uh, not XPF, excuse me, WPF for the form stuff that doesn't exist on Linux. But um, that's, what, that's what runs that window that you saw that comes up that had all the text in there. So that, that's a pretty kind of complicated example, but that kind of gives you an idea of just like that's the power that's here. Is, again, you, can, you get the representation of whatever somebody typed into PS Readline, and you can do literally whatever you can. If you can write it in PowerShell or you can write it even in C Sharp, you can have that actually do anything. You could, have, you could hit F1 and have it trigger a build script and do all kinds of stuff and run off these things and then come back and say, okay, it worked or it didn't. And you can make that a PS Readline key handler. And all you have to do is understand a little bit about how the AST works to be able to parse what that text is. So another example here is taking text from the clipboard and inserting it as a here string. So if um, this is really good, like if you have some text from a clipboard and it has a bunch of commas and quotes in it, like... We'll see if this still works. But, uh, try control all the control shift all the there we go. Okay, it worked. Four year old code that I haven't used worked worked the first time every time. So what I just did there is I have this code that if I paste this, well, I, I happen to get lucky that see how like this code doesn't really like come together as a thing. I can't now it's like giving me continuation prompts and it's not really a thing. It's because I have all these special characters in there that are PowerShell significant. If you want to be able to paste something in, I made a PowerShell shortcut where you do control alt shift V and it will take whatever's in the clipboard, which right now there's nothing. Let me grab this guy here again. If you do control alt shift V. It will take what you have in the clipboard and make it a here string, which if you don't know what a here string is, it basically says those two symbols say, if it's not, if anything in between these two symbols, ignore it. Like, don't try to parse this at all, PowerShell. And so it's really useful if you're trying to display, like, special characters and stuff and don't want to worry about your script there. And you don't want to do, uh, have to put in backticks all through the thing. Or even worse, you're accepting user input and you want to make sure that it's sanitized so that they can't, like, inject stuff into your code. So that's a really simple example of a rewrite, and I'll show what that looks like here. Whichever window it was in. Mm. Oh, never mind, the other, the test profile. So this guy, same deal. So here we go, we've got this. Um, we wanna paste that. 
I have no idea why that's there, but let's let's just say it's important. Sure, why not? Oh, it, I needed that because I wanted to be able to get to the clipboard, which is a very Windows specific thing. So I needed this part of the of the uh, um, especially on Windows uh, PowerShell 5.1. I needed to be able to bring that thing in to get these methods. So the first thing I do is I check, hey, does the clipboard have text in it? Um, if it does, then I take that text and I just do a regex on it to trim some stuff out. And then once I've done that regex in PS Console Readline, I add an I add that here string starter, and then I have the text, and then I want another new line. That's what this backtick end looks means, and then end it with um, the other here string. Otherwise, uh, play a sound. So like if there was nothing on the clipboard, but the, I don't have the sound on right now, but when you would in control shift V, it would have just gone bing, and you're like, oh, okay, I forgot something. So like, again, these also don't have to be complicated. Where I had that complicated example up there, it's pretty simple to make just that. And this doesn't even really require any AST per se, because you can just get the text part. Um, but typically the AST you will use because you're trying to analyze what somebody's doing on the command line and provide that information. Um, here's one, for instance, like if you're writing something to fix the parentheses, there's all kinds of examples here. So um, that's an example of using uh, the AST for uh, keyboard shortcuts and making your own shortcuts in PS Readline, PS Readline key handlers. So think about things that you can do with that, implement them, and you can you know put them up online, make them a gist, share them, and you know people can put them in their profile, and all of us can have all kinds of cool like Vine Emacs type stuff, but just in PS Readline. You don't it can be its own thing. Um, another thing that um, can be done is argument completers. So argument completers don't strictly have to use the AST, but it can be helpful for certain things. Um, I have here an example of an argument completer. So when you write an argument completer, there's lots of ways to write argument completers, by the way. If you go to the help article, there's like six different ways to do it. Um, this is an older style way of doing it, but it's more powerful because you have the option of the AST, but it is slower than some of the other options. So what this basically does is we have our AST, we have a copy of our AST, we can go through, we have these possible values that the parameter can have, and we can check those possible values, and if it matches our word to complete, then we're gonna go ahead and do that, otherwise we're just gonna keep stepping through. So if I take this and I run it, I have my Big happy one, that means I should be able to alt enter here. Alt enter is my version of F5. I, that's just fine for like run selection in terminal. You can rebind all the keys in VS Code to whatever you want, your preferences. I like that, I do it. You know, your mileage may vary. And so once I have that, so I can do test argument completer, and this thing's gonna totally run over my code. There we go. Test argument completer dash value, and then tabs here calls that function and gives me my possible options. So this is debuggable. I don't think I really have time to go, th I, I didn't dot source it here. Let me restart and let's try debugging it here. Just so you can see that you can debug these things too. So restart my terminal. I'm going to start a PowerShell interactive session, which just simply means, you know, if you see a breakpoint anywhere when I'm doing something, do it. Put a breakpoint there. Make sure I import this specific code by dot sourcing it. And deal with all the quote goodness that exists. And then we are going to run my test argue. Actually, let's see, F7 callback. It doesn't work in VS Code because it's intercepting it, but that would have been cool. Never mind. Uh, test argument completer dash value. And so when I hit tab, you'll see I drop down and it hits where my breakpoint was. And you can see I get the information about the command, I get the parameter name, but I also get the AST that is matching what I had typed so far. And that AST object that Command AST, as you can see over here in the fancy best part of VS Code that exists, which is the variable information that I had no part in, I swear. Um, you can see all that AST information and see how it breaks it down into command elements. There's test argument completer. It's got a parent. The extent itself has a start and finish. And then under that, it has certain command elements. One part is an argument completer that's known as a bare word. Another part is a value that is a parameter. And it knows that, as you can see, there's, there's all this extremely detailed information about what that script looks like to PowerShell and the parser. And you can use any of this information to construct your rules and construct how it behaves. And um, 
and how you're going to provide answers. So there's a huge amount of possibilities here for what you can write. You're not really locked into a box of, oh, you can only do this limited number of things. So that's just to show you that you can step through these and debug them as you're writing them. But in short, basically, we have these possibilities. And this one basically works on if my first parameter, the type was, is how I got all the different kinds. But here's where it's a little more dynamic. Do test argument completer. If I specify a type of fruits, and I do the, about the value thing. This time, when it goes through, uh, we have these. And when we get down here, and if the fake bound parameters contain a particular type, filter it to just those possible values is what this says. So we go to continue to run. And I'll probably have to stop the debugger to make this actually work because I don't think it'll output correctly. Yeah, breakpoints, make sure there's no lingering ones. There are a few. File an issue on this later, Andy, I promise. And we will again do the test argument leader. Dash type fruits, dash value. And so this time, I'm only getting completers that are fruits. So you can use the AST to not only use just what the phrase was, but interpret based on other parameters. Good example of this. Um, in, if you've ever used like any of the AZ modules, if you um, do something like get AZ resource or get AZ VM and you specify dash resource group first, and then you get to the thing and you hit control space, it only completes things that are in that resource group versus what are in the entire subscription. That's because they're doing stuff like this. They, they look first, hey, are, have you asked for a particular resource group? Okay, does that exist? Okay, then we only need to return the ones that are in that resource group because clearly it seems to me your intent is you don't want to put in a VM that's going to cause this command to fail, so we're only going to show you in the completer the ones that matter. So these are ways that you can make your commands much more like user-friendly and intuitive. Um, a really great example I have is I wrote, I wrote a module for the privileged identity management in AZ, and it has all kinds of super helpful autocompleters that, you know, if, if you've tried to do it manually, it's a GUID-driven nightmare. You got to know the GUID that matches the GUID, that adds the GUID, that connects to the GUID. I make it so just you just do enable role, dash role, hit tab, what's my role? You choose that role. How long is it? It automatically goes out and finds out what your available roles are. It's just much more user-friendly. And that's just an example of something like if what's built in isn't easy, you can make your own thing to make it easier. So one last thing before we go to questions. Um, finally, uh, one of the main things that you can also write with these um, are your own PS script analyzer rules. So this is the one that where AST really comes in handy because it's really, really difficult to write an effective script analyzer rule without using the AST. Because what you're getting is you're not just getting a prompt, you're getting somebody's entire script that you can then look for issues on. So script analyzer rules seem really intimidating, especially if you look at like the C-sharp portion of it, but it is possible to write them in PowerShell. And there's a, real, a lot of really good articles out there that explain it. Um, I always like to also drive by example. This is really buried, and I've never understood why, but basically in the script analyzer is this file that was a bunch of community rules that has nobody's contributed one in like four years, but there's so many excellent examples in there that I almost want to integrate into my day-to-day. My -day. So if we go to this file here, if my thing doesn't completely lock up again, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. I'll take questions while this thing takes care of that real quick. Any questions so far, like the AST or completers or anything like that? Yeah. So the question is, what does the extent thing contain? And the answer is, I don't really know that well. Like, it's a lot of sort of abstract terminology. Basically, the extent is the idea that, um, if, if I understand it correctly with my limited knowledge, the extent part is basically saying, like, here's your command. Say you have a really long script and you have like a function. So when, when, you get, when you get down the tree to where that function is, the extent is like the scope of that function. So when you look at extent, it's going to show that much and still have all the child stuff under that. If you then go into that tree and you go into like, say, the param block, then your extent is going to be that param block. So it's kind of like a scope. Does that make sense? And I may, I may be wrong about that. I'm sure there's somebody who ever wrote it who's watching this being like, no, and firing up on Discord right now. But as I like to say, there's this great thing called Cunningham's Law, which is the best way to get the right answer is not to uh, ask a question. The best way to get it is to post the wrong answer on the internet, and you will get that 
you will be corrected very quickly. The PowerShell Discord, if you want to go through the chat history, I am the living embodiment of that. I go in there and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this. And then Patrick or Chris come in and they're like, ah, no, you are totally wrong. I'm like, well, all right, well, that's the actual answer. So basically, that's my understanding of it. I may be wrong, but in general, like that's my working understanding of it. But the, the main thing about it is that if you, you know, you can just go in there and discover it and see it. And also there's the full documentation. All right, let's see if we can hook this back up before we run out of time. And finally show some custom script analyzer rules. I got it down there. I don't got it up there. Oh, almost three, two, one. Ta da! All right. So uh, we'll go back over here. And so this is, I just cloned that folder down here for what those community analyzer rules are. And so if you look in here, uh, let's go, okay, see, so let's go full Zen mode here. So if you look in this file, it, it's a long file because these are all kinds of different rules. But there's a bunch of different rules that have been defined. Let's see, can I let's see, fold all? Okay, that helps. So basically, somebody is, uh, you can go to each of these and see what they're about. So, like, here's one, for instance, that measures how many, you know, if you're using a command that requires administrative rights, this is a PS script analyzer rule that can find out um, using the AST, find that you are. You know, if you're using something that requires admin rights, it can pop up an analyzer rule saying, hey, you probably want to make sure you're doing this in an elevated window and make sure that you have you leave a flag that says you're doing that. Um, here's another one. Um, it basically, this is a one where you sh if you type, if you in your script, you type import module AZ, it'll give you an analyzer rule saying, hey, you really should use pound requires for this. That way the script won't error at the point that it needs it, but it'll check that you have that module before it even runs. So what I'm going to do is just show an example of a couple of these after I get out of Zen mode. Okay, see if I can. There we go. So here's a couple analyzer tests. So here's two things that can get flagged. One is just import module without using requires. As I talked earlier, just using write host in general. Now, I think write host is totally fine. If you're version PowerShell, I think 5.0 or higher, there's no reason not to use write host anymore. There are still better ways to do output, but write host doesn't kill kittens. I don't care what Don Jones says. I'm saying it right here. You know, it might beat them up a little bit, but you know, they'll live. It's fine. Um, so, but, but somebody, I'm sure Don Jones, if I went into the commit history, Don Jones wrote this rule, but we'll find out. Um, we will uh, take, here's the test. So I have the rules here and I'm just going to get the path to them. And you can actually integrate this into VS Code too. I'm not going to show that part here real quick, but you can make it so that these rules just run, your own custom rules run in addition to the ones that you usually get when you get all the problems and errors and that kind of stuff. I'm just going to do it the old school way. And let's just make sure I'm in my extension terminal. And I do invoke script analyzer. So here I'm going to do invoke script analyzer. I'm calling it for, I'm sorry for the long paths. Basically, I'm calling that this analyzer test file and I want to use my own custom rules for it. So let's bring this up big, run that. And that did not come out in a nice way. So let's put that into out grid view. Okay, so now here we go. And you see we get our rules and line one, it's telling us the require statement prevents a script for these things. You should use requires instead of import module. And my other custom rule, it is generally accepted you should never use write host in any script output whatsoever. I think that's a little judgmental, but hey, it's your custom rule. You can have it say whatever you want. So this is an example that like, if you have company rules about not using certain things, or you want to flag that you want to make sure that they always like, maybe you install modules, you want to make sure they always only install from the internal repository. You can write your own script analyzer rules. You can write ones that um, uh, if you have like a particular style of, of doing things, you want certain variables to always be named in a certain style. You can write one to do that. And you can even write them so that they can fix things so that you can say, if they did it this way, if there's a way to auto fix that, you can add the code to do that. So that I'll use the AST. You can see all those examples out there. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. And I hope you have an idea of how the AST works and all these different places where it is and how it can enable you to add your own functionality and tune and tweak PowerShell to work for you. Because we're all just here trying to get through, be more productive. This is just one more way to be productive. So thank you very much.